Uh, good morning. Thank you all for uh, braving the elements this morning and coming out to, to join us and support us in our ongoing Distinguished Speaker Series uh, sponsored by CREATE. And CREATE, as you probably all know, is the Center for Risk and Economic Analysis of Terrorism Events. We're one of a number of centers of excellence in the Department of Homeland Security sponsored out of the Science and Technology Directorate. Our center's mission is to improve national security through the development and application of tools for calculating the dangers and effects of terrorism. And we've been fortunate enough to have this distinguished speaker series now going on the second year. We thought it would be very important for us to provide a forum for noted experts around the world to share their insight into the challenges and some of the other issues as it relates to transnational threats, homegrown violent extremism, but more importantly, talk about some of their solutions, some of their ideas, and some of the interdisciplinary responses that we have to these issues. We've been very fortunate since last year to start off our event in the summer of 2010 with Richard Clark, who, as you all know, was the National Coordinator for Security, Infrastructure, and Counterterrorism, and advisor to four United States presidents. We followed that up with former Secretary of Homeland Security, Michael Chertoff. In the fall of 2010, last spring, we had Foreign Policy Research Institute and former CIA MD, PhD uh, expert, Mark Sageman. We then had last summer, as part of our CREATE Executive Program in Counterterrorism, David Gartenstein Ross, who's a noted terrorism expert and author, Last fall, we had Maria Reza, who was the CNN Bureau Chief in Jakarta and is now a, an author in residence at Nanyang Technological Institute in Singapore. And fortunately, today, we're delighted to have my colleague and good friend, uh, Brian Jenkins. And like some of these other folks here, who is usually out of the country, we're fortunately enough, fortunate enough to have him here today to join us as our distinguished speaker. What I would like to do is start this off with just giving you an example of one of the more than 200 projects and research endeavors that we're engaged in with our partners around the country. Our, on behalf of our director, Stephen Hora, who ha actually is embedded at the Department of Homeland Security right now for three months at the Science and Technology Directorate. And he's actually leading the project I'm going to show you this morning, which is called UCAS. And in fact, uh, Brian Jenkins is working on that project as one of our researchers. The R and the E in CREATE stand for Risk and Economic Analysis. And the project we'll be discussing is one that links these two concepts together to look at the optimum trade-offs between security measures and economic activity in an urban environment. We've titled the project UCAS for Urban Commerce Security Study. For the UCAS project, we're looking at the security and economic trade-offs in the lower Manhattan area. This is a 1.7 square mile area that has a lot of area to cover that requires a lot of protection. In considering how best to enhance security in the Lower Manhattan area, a Ring of Steel model has been discussed through the launch of the Lower Manhattan Security Initiative. The Ring of Steel was originally implemented in Belfast in the 1970s. The idea there was to protect the city center by building a kind of urban fortress around the region where they closed off all major roads and only had limited access through police protected entrances. This idea was later enhanced and developed upon in London, where they not only took the idea of closing off the city center through closed off roads entrances, but they also implemented chicanes and a very complex CCTV camera, um, camera monitoring system throughout the city. Security measures are most effective as systems with layers of security. The effectiveness of a system of security measures is not simply the aggregation or the sum of the effectiveness of the different components within the system of security measures. Security measures, if evaluated in such a simplistic manner, may lead to a misapplication of resources, thereby uh, increasing expenditures and uh, not achieving uh, optimal security. Evaluation of security measures in isolation may also not account for the uh, synergies and the redundancies that may be present within security measures. For example, closed circuit TVs without the uh, presence of resources to investigate suspicious uh, uh, circumstances 
may not uh, lead to uh, enhanced security. The diagram you see shows economic activity on the vertical axis and risk on the horizontal axis. And the red dots represent portfolios of security measures. The question is, where do we want to be among all these possible portfolios? And the answer is, there is an efficient frontier, which is to the upper left of the diagram, that shows those portfolios that have the optimal level of economic activity given a fixed level of risk, or vice versa, for a given level of economic activity, we minimize risk. Any other portfolio that is not on that upper boundary would be suboptimal. Al-Qaeda has said they would destroy us by a death of a thousand cuts. And what they mean by that is that we can actually destroy ourselves. If we have so much security that it suffocates economic activity, it will cost us a great deal. Security at any price is just not a good policy. What is called for is a balanced scientific approach that weighs off security and economic activity. That video, by the way, is on our site. It's one of, as I mentioned, more than 200 projects that we're working on at CREATE. Um, and I have to do this because, uh, as I mentioned, our director, Steve Horry, is embedded at DHS right now. But our director of research, uh, Isaac Maya, is here today. And he has the, if you will, the honor and distinct <laughs> pleasure of working with some 20 institutions around the country and the world in managing those 200 projects, so I, I don't envy him. So, we are shared by the Viterbi School of Engineering and the Saul Price School of Public Policy. I'm very fortunate and honored to have here today our Dean of the Saul Price School of Public Policy and holder of the C. Irwin and Ione L. Piper Dean's Chair in this school since 2005. He's a former professor of public policy and management at the University of Illinois. And we've had Dean not here for quite some time. He's been extremely supportive of CREATE. He's been supportive of our executive program in counterterrorism, having spoken at that venue and during that forum uh, each year. And also, if I may, steal a little bit of thunder uh, due to his diligent efforts and, if you will, um, foresight, he recently traveled to Israel with our president of the university and in February signed a memorandum of understanding with the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya, Israel, will now be partnered with us in a number of research endeavors, research scholar exchanges, and other programs. So without further ado, it gives me a great honor and privilege to introduce to you Dean Jack Knott. Uh, well, welcome. Uh, this is the Soul Price School of Public Policy's uh, primary building, uh, so we're pleased to host you here uh, in Lewis Hall. Uh, it's, we're also uh, very pleased to have this uh, partnership uh, with the Viterbi School of Engineering. It's been a great uh, cross-school partnership uh, at the university. But as you know, CREATE is also partnering with governments and other universities in the private sector, so it's a great public-private partnership really across the country and uh, we're going to make partnerships also across the world. So I'm, uh, it's been great working with Isaac and with Errol and uh, with Steve uh, in the leadership of this uh, institute and I think it's one of the most creative, innovative institutes uh, in the country and, and possibly in the world as well, focusing on counterterrorism. Uh, intersects nicely also with our school because we also have experts that deal with issues of um, natural disasters and some of the work they do on uh, Homeland Security also overlaps with that. Uh, my uh, main role is to introduce our guest speaker uh, and we're very pleased to have him here, uh, Brian Jenkins. He's a senior advisor to the president of the RAND Corporation and the author of Will Terrorists Go Nuclear and several, several other RAND monographs and terrorism related topics. And, as I was driving in here this morning, they were doing a program on NPR, and it was uh, Will Terrorists Go Cyber? Uh, and it was based on this book, um, uh, Hunting in the Shadows. I've forgotten the author. You may, you may know the author. So uh, uh, the nature of the threats is uh, multiple, really. And the cyber threat was something that I uh, wasn't fully cognizant of, uh, but it's obviously related to the, most of the other threats. 
Uh, he served as uh, chair of the political science department at RAND. It's probably the only thing we have in common. I was chair of the political science department at Michigan State for a while. Uh, and uh, in anticipation of the 10 year anniversary of 9-11, uh, he spearheaded the RAND effort to take, kind of take stock of America's reactions, uh, policy reactions, and give thoughtful consideration to what we should be doing for strategy in the future. And uh, this effort was presented in the report, The Long Shadow of 9-11, America's Response to Terrorism. Uh, Brian has also had considerable uh, military experience and a very distinguished military experience. He was commissioned in the infantry uh, but he became a paratrooper and captain in the Green Berets. He is a decorated combat veteran, having served in the 7th Special Forces Group in the Dominican Republic, uh, and with the uh, 5th Special Forces Group in Vietnam. And he returned to Vietnam as a member of the Long Range Planning Task Group and received the Department of the Army's highest award uh, for this service. And uh, he's also uh, Worked with the White House in 1996. President Clinton appointed him uh, to the White House Commission on Aviation Safety and Security. And from 1999 to 2000, he served as advisor to the National Commission on Terrorism. And in 2000, was appointed to the U.S. Comptroller General's Advisory Board. And uh, in addition, he's an expert on transportation and surface transportation security. Uh, having been a research associate at the Mineta, Mineta uh, Transportation Institute, where he conducted research on protecting surface transportation against terror, terrorism attacks. So uh, an amazing record, a wide range of experience, both here and abroad in, in uh, counterterrorism. And it's our great pleasure to have him as our guest speaker. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, I, I, I really want to thank uh, my, my, my friend and, and, and your colleague, Earl Southers, for <coughs> inviting me to participate in, in the speakers uh, series. And I also do want to compliment um, uh, him and, and, and Isaac and, and, and Steve Cora on the, the tremendous work that CREATE has done uh, in, in this area. There's a basic asymmetry here, and un unlike conventional war, where military forces must attack a specific set of targets within a certain time frame for it to have some uh, military meaning, some, some utility. Uh, a terrorist, theoretically, can attack anything, anywhere, anytime. And we simply cannot protect everything, everywhere, all the time. We, we have finite resources. So we have to make choices about the allocation of resources, about the deployment of those resources, about the measures that we choose to implement. And CREATE has done a really tremendous work in informing decision makers, in, in making those decisions so that they can uh, ensure the effectiveness or the efficiency of the various security measures that, that are, being, uh, are being implemented. Um, you saw the brief tape about the uh, urban commerce and security study. Um, uh, our contribution to that, uh, one report just came out, which I, which I will promote, and that's called uh, Carnage Interrupted. And it is an, it, it's an analysis of 15 terrorist plots against surface transportation. And in many of those cases, we see that the terrorists were contemplating a broad spectrum of, of targets. And then, on the basis of what they thought was suitable, operational considerations, their capabilities, vulnerabilities, things of that sort, they focused on a, 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 a specific target. In some cases, for, for capricious uh, uh, reasons. Um, a forthcoming report is, is going to really um, provide greater detail to um, the issue that uh, the brief history that Heather mentioned in, in, the, uh, in the brief clip there. And that is actually looking at the experience of creating these urban security zones or urban defense zones. So it looks at uh, Belfast, it looks at London, 
Um, it looks at the experience of, of Paris and some things they did, although they didn't have a formal ring of steel. It, it looks at um, the, the experience in, in uh, the city of Washington. It looks at the construction of the security wall in Israel. It looks at the Lower Manhattan Security Initiative, and it tries to distill some, some uh, basic principles from those uh, actual historical experiences. Um, we're going to cover a number of, 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 of topics uh, uh, today. We're going we're to talk about some of the, the fundamental um, uh, challenges in the analysis of the terrorist threat. That's where I spend most of my time trying to get the terrorist threat right. Um, we're, we're going to talk about where, where we think we are in the, in, in the overall effort against uh, Al-Qaeda and the jihadist terrorist enterprise. And we're going to talk about uh, the, the threat of homegrown terrorism. And then, quite frankly, I'm, I'm going to go off message here a little bit and talk to you about some of, the, some of the developments that we've seen in our society over the past 10 years that caused me some misgivings. Uh, I would not make it, I would not be accepted into the ranks of, of, of civil libertarians. Um, uh, it's not where my basic sympathies lie. Uh, on the other hand, there are some issues here where I think we are, we're, we're treading against some, some issues here in terms of, of provoking backlash among, in, uh, among the public and in doing some things that, that you really want to take a step back and, and think carefully about. And so, this is, this is complicated business. I also, want to, I, I also want to thank all of you for, for, for being here. I, I, I know that you've got busy schedules. I, I know that some of you are here, many of you are here, I hope, because of your interest in, in, in the topic. And I suspect some of you also have some very strongly held views uh, about these issues for, for which you seek confirmation. Uh, if, if not a, a confrontation, that's the that's the, the nature of, of terrorism. This is this is it, it provokes a great deal of emotion, and and that by the way complicates. It really complicates the the, the business of of, of threat uh, assessment. Um, analysts are regularly divided. Uh, uh, when we when we look at this, um, there are differences. Not about what has happened. We, we know what has happened. I mean, there's an event. Uh, but often about how to interpret uh, the event. For example, was 9-11 an anomaly, an outlier? Not likely to ever see anything of that scale again. Or was it the harbinger of things to come? Well, you know, looking back 10 years, we can begin to say, you know, we kind of think this might have been an anomaly here. On the other hand, in the immediate shadow of 9-11, that was not an assumption we could afford to make. We, uh, we had just suffered the worst terrorist attack in, 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 in history. Um, we had no idea of how many additional plans might be in the pipeline, and we had to take desperate measures to pound on uh, Al-Qaeda's capabilities in, in order to ensure that there wasn't going to be a second and a third 9-11. Uh, 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 there are differences about what seems most likely to happen in the future. And we'll address some of these. And what, what's going to happen in Afghanistan with the withdrawal of uh, uh, U.S. And, and, and NATO forces in the area? What's going to happen uh, in, in the broader Middle East with the, with the uh, revolutions that we see that have taken place there, that are taking place there? Um, I spent a good part of last summer in the Middle East. We'll be back in the Middle East uh, this, this coming summer. Um, we had great difficulty looking at those events, trying to reach any sort of consensus. The only consensus was the dice are still tumbling down the table here. We don't know where this is going to come out, except it's probably going to be unstable for the next 10 years. Um, there are differences of opinion about the likelihood of the terrorist use of weapons of mass destruction. Is this, 
Is this something that is only a, uh, not a matter of, 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 of if but when, to use that famous phrase? Or is this something that with uh, proper investments in security of fissile material and other things in the area of health and so on that we can, uh, we can address? There are great differences about exactly what is the threat to the United States. Is it, is it still Al-Qaeda and its, and its uh, like-minded uh, fanatics? Is it tomorrow's Al-Qaeda, whatever Al-Qaeda may morph into over the next five to ten years? Is it broader? Is it, is it Islamic fundamentalist? Is it something inherent in Islam itself? Not necessarily my view, but, 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 but certainly a, a, a point of view. Uh, or are we looking at new terrorist actors that could be activated by our uh, a growing confrontation with Iran, a completely different uh, 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 set of, 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 of villains? Uh, how we assess the threat is, is really crucial. This is, this is not just an, an exercise in, 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 in academic analysis here. I mean, um, I mean, consider two very different views of the terrorist threat. Suppose you're the President of the United States or, or the Director of Homeland Security, and, and I'm called in to, to give you a briefing, and I say, look, it's not Islam, it's Al-Qaeda. It's Al-Qaeda that's at war with the West. Uh, there is, to be sure, a terrorism th threat. That's real, but it's, it's not strategic. It's not going to bring down the Republic. The Al-Qaeda we confront now is largely a spent force. It's still got a kick, but, but not what it was uh, uh, ten years ago. It is true that the Taliban may expand their control over parts of Afghanistan as the U.S. departs, but they're not likely to permit al-Qaeda to use Afghan territory as they did before to launch new 9-11s. That's a reasonable briefing which you could uh, uh, possibly hear in, in, in Washington today. Now, that would have one set of implications. Suppose instead I was called in and gave the briefing that, look, it's not just Al-Qaeda. Islam itself is the threat. Um, if so, then the consequences of that is that uh, the, the United States is in effect at war with 1.2 billion Muslims in the world, and several million Muslim Americans represent a potential fifth column. Say, not necessarily my point of view, but, but you can find it in congressional briefings and, 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 and hearings. Al-Qaeda may not possess nuclear weapons today, but within five to ten years, Al-Qaeda or other terrorists are likely to have a serious biological weapons capability. Um, there are some doomsday scenarios that we're really worried about involving epidemics or electromagnetic pulses or, or other things. Um, those again, that briefing would have a completely different set of consequences and, and, and how we... So it's, it's important we get it right. And, and here's where it becomes complicated, because so much of, so much of our perception of the threat um, reflects deeply held views again. And, and these views lie beyond the evidence. Uh, when, when you look at, at, at terrorism, what you're really looking at is not only the threat posed by the terrorists, but the, the perceptions of the audience, us. And in the United States, I mean, in many cases, terrorism uh, reflects broader anxieties in our society, broader anxieties about American decline, broader anxieties about imminent doom, our place in the world. Is the United States uh, on, on the downhill side? What about control of our borders, what about issues of, of, of crime, social cohesion, uh, uh, political divisions in, in our society. Um, there are fears among many about post-terrorist catastrophe anarchy. I mean, there's a whole television show about preppers, I mean, people who are, are stockpiling weapons and food and are ready for whatever. Uh, it's not always built upon great logic, but, but it's, a strongly, it's a strongly held belief. There are 
powerful, powerful Christian beliefs that the end times are near. Um, we tend to think of ourselves as a, as, as a secular people, but the fact is that these belief systems are, 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 are deeply rooted, and many people see these events as, as signs of the end times. There's no question that there are anti-Muslim sentiments and that promote the view, unfortunately, that Al-Qaeda is merely a manifestation of an inherently <coughs> aggressive Islam. Again, not my point of view, but, but one that has a sufficient amount of historical baggage that it can't easily be dis dismissed. So with, with the problem is then looking at the evidence and, and dealing with all of these other extraneous factors that affect our perceptions, where are we in this thing? How are we doing? What, what is the threat? Or to put it in the words, the, the, the question that is most frequently asked me uh, by, by reporters, you know, Mr. Jenkins in the global war on terror, what's the score? Um, now how many damn times have I been asked that? I was, I, 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 tremendously annoying. I was actually on, on national television, and I, and I had a report. I said, Mr. Jenkins, and it was on one of the anniversaries of 9-11. In the global war on terror, what's the score? I shot back, it's three to two. <laughs> <laughs> that satisfied him for about four seconds on air, and he said, Three to two. I said, well, who's ahead? I said, that's a much more complicated question. <laughs> so what, what, what can we say? Where, 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 where is there some kind of consensus on this? Well, there's no question that <coughs> Al-Qaeda's operational capabilities have been reduced. Their, their easily accessible training camps have been dispersed. Um, their, their Networks, terrorist networks that they had created in Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Turkey, Indonesia, have been largely dismantled, not entirely. Their leadership has been decimated by uh, drone strikes and arrests. I mean, the principal architects of 9-11. Um, uh, I don't know how many number threes in, in Al-Qaeda we have, we have, we have knocked off. And, Bin Laden, we're coming up to the anniversary of, 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 his, uh, uh, of his death, uh, their leadership really ha is very much on the run. On unprecedented unanimity of focus and cooperation among uh, the world's intelligence services and law enforcement organizations has made their operating environment a lot more hostile. The kinds of transactions, moving people across frontiers, moving money, communicating, all of the kinds of things that they did, by the way, in the planning of 9-11 now have become a lot more dangerous uh, uh, for them. As a consequence, there hasn't been a major uh, successful terrorist attack in the West since 2005. That's, that's good news. Bin Laden's death does have an impact. It's, uh, their core was already weakened. And it, and it's not that he was the CEO, but he, he clearly had an inspirational life narrative. He was a, undoubtedly a, a charismatic communicator. Um, the man really communicated in, in, in a way that, that it's, it's, it's hard to find a, a, a Western counterpart, the closest I can come to it, in, in terms of the, the, the poetry, and I'll use that term, the poetry of his, of his language, was, was perhaps General MacArthur. General MacArthur spoke about the rattle of musketry. Now, there wasn't a lot of musketry in World War II, but he evoked, in a sense, a sense of the eternal warrior and, and spirit. There's a few other figures uh, 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 like that. Um, what he did was he maintained Al-Qaeda's unanimity of focus. He, he kept that thing together. Uh, no successor sp speaks with, with his authority. Um, and, and so that really was a, a, a loss. Now, there are all sorts of vows of revenge when he was killed. We're coming up on the first year anniversary of that. Obviously, there's a bit of apprehension thus far. Knock wood, we're, we're still waiting. Um, we, haven't, we haven't seen it yet. Now, all of that is good news uh, to us, but at the same time, we have to admit that Al-Qaeda has morphed to meet new circumstances. 
Uh, the Al-Qaeda today is far more decentralized, far more dependent on its uh, affiliates, um, which are still very much in, in, in business, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Al-Qaeda Al in the Islamic uh, Maghreb, um, Al-Qaeda uh, in its recently announced uh, uh, formal now alliance with Al-Shabaab, um, Al-Qaeda's growing influence in the Sahara and Sahel regions of, of Africa. So they're still in business, albeit more decentralized. They are more dependent on their allies, Lashkar e Toiba and, uh, and, uh, and, and various other floating crap games in, 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 um, in, in, in Pakistan uh, who have been radicalized by Al-Qaeda's uh, ideology. And they're far more dependent on their ability to inspire homegrown uh, 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 terrorists. That, and this has been a fundamental shift in strategy, uh, an embracing uh, uh, of, of do-it-yourself terror, uh, uh, do it yourself terrorism as, as a strategy. Um, and, and this means a more diffused threat, less destructive perhaps, but potentially dangerous plots that are harder, harder to detect. Uh, to support this, to support this uh, uh, strategy, um, they have made a major uh, communications effort. There's a, there's a big, uh, a big recruiting effort. It's done through jihadist websites. Uh, there are thousands of these. There are the handful of those that are the official organizational websites at the top, and there's sort of a second tier. Where, where well-connected jihadist strategies discuss these issues, and then you come down to this mass of, of, of sort of uh, uh, do-it-yourself online uh, discussions, the, the chat rooms, the, 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 the other things where, where people uh, uh, beat their chests and boast and make threats and exhort each other to, to action. Um, uh, there was, until last fall, an uh, online magazine called Inspire. I uh, don't know if, if, if all of you are old enough, but, but back in the 50s and early 60s, there were magazines like, uh, men's magazines like Saga and Argosy and things like that. They were men's adventure magazines. They always had, you know, uh, some guy in a front cover that looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, torn shirt. Uh, <laughs> You know, Python curling up his leg, you know, 50 caliber machine gun in one arm and, 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 and gorgeous broad in bikini in the other. And, and these were adventure magazines. And they had articles about weapons and they had uh, things. Inspire was kind of like that. I mean, a lot of graphics and sort of my adventures in jihad. And, and by the way, here's, here's how to disassemble and, and, and clean an AK-47 and, and put it back together. Now, not a lot of guys reading Inspire Online had AK-47s, but it allowed a kind of vicarious participation. They were part of something. This was sort of like, you know, political porn. You, know, you, could, you could watch this. <laughs> um, and, and so they made this big effort, a big, a, 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 big, a big retail effort, a lot of retail outlets. What are the results? Well, let's take a look at the numbers. And here, happily, we can get really empirical. We can actually, actually have stuff to look at. Um, between 9-11 and the end of 2011, there were 96 cases of jihadist homegrown terrorism. Now, I'm, I'm not counting Hamas and Hezbollah fundraising activities. I'm looking at Al-Qaeda, Lashkar Yitorv, the, the jihadist terrorist enterprise. 96 cases. Uh, those involve terrorists either uh, an individual providing material assistance to a terrorist organization. That's a, a, um, an area of crime that has been expanded since 9-11, fairly broad. Um, it includes those who attempted to go abroad to join jihadist fronts in Somalia or Pakistan. And it includes those who most seriously plotted to carry out terrorist attacks in this country. Um, in these 96 cases, there were 192 persons who were either indicted 
or self-identified. I mean, in some cases, they were never indicted, but they ended up turning up in Somalia with an explosives vest attached, uh, 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 attached to them. So 192. Um, that's a tiny turnout. That really is. I mean, there are several, um, um, there are several million Muslim Americans. There's no precise figure on that. Um, criminologists, you know, like to use per, uh, a number per 100,000. That's how we measure homicides. That's how we measure crime. If we were to look at that, that turns out to be over a 10-year period, six per 100,000. Not, not a big number. It turns out on an annual basis to be 0.6 per 100,000, which really means you do a lot of looking for very little finding in, 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 in the area of, of, of intelligence, but, but it's a low yield. It, it would be comparing apples and oranges, but just keep in mind that the prison population in the United States is about 750 out of 100,000. So when we talk about 600,000, this is, this is small stuff. Um, they're just not selling a lot of, not selling a lot of cars. I mean, if I were in charge of their marketing, uh, I'd be in trouble on, 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 on this. There's no evidence of any army of sleepers. We worried about that right after 9-11. There's no vast underground. There's no uh, a, a deep reservoir. Uh, of, of support in, in the Muslim community. In fact, the figures show that the Muslim community in America has, has rejected this ideology. There are, to be sure, veins of resentment. There are handfuls of hotheads, um, but nothing indicating any kind of, any, any, any kind of, uh, 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 of deep-rooted support. The decisions to join jihad were, were personal. Uh, no evidence of community support. And indeed, in many of the cases that were uncovered, it was a tip from the community that led to the investigative, uh, the investigative case. Now, we have no idea of how many more cases were prevented because of dissuasion by family and friends within the community. You can't count things that don't occur, but it does take place. So who are these people? Who are these 192 uh, 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 people. Well, their ages range from 18 to 76 years old. Uh, average age about 32, median age 27. That's above the age of the normal 18 to 24 criminal offenders in, in the United States. Um, about 74% of them in all are U.S. citizens. Uh, most of those U.S. born citizens uh, uh, the others naturalized citizens. 24 of the 192 were legal permanent residents. Then we have uh, t uh, other foreign nationals. Only six illegals. Six illegals. So this isn't an issue. It's not as if they're slipping into the country. Just that's not occurring. Um, about a quarter of them are born, are U.S. born with non-Muslim surnames. Most of those are converts. Um, Somalis and Pakistanis, however, predominate. Not surprising. Not surprising. In Europe, it's Somalis, Algerians, and Pakistanis. And it really is, it, it, it's just basically a reflection of, you look at the diasporas, the ethnic makeup of diasporas, and you look at home countries in conflict. And where you have a home country in conflict and you have a large diaspora, you have a higher probability of representation of of, of, of those in the community. In terms of education, 25% of them hadn't completed high school. 22% had high school diplomas. 40% some university. 13% college degrees. 6% postgraduate degrees. Turns out, by the way, that that is pretty close to the national average in <coughs> general. In other words, it's not as if they're smarter or dumber or less educated or more educated, if we were to take 192 at random uh, uh, U.S. males of that age, that is roughly what we would have. The only difference would be a few more jihadists start college and then drop out or switch their major to terrorism. They, they, they switch to Al-Qaeda. <laughs> Why do they do that? Why? Um, religious belief is a component, but it doesn't appear to be the key factor. Um, personal grievances, personal circumstances, sense of anger, 
desire for collective revenge, really important. Feelings of humiliation, want to demonstrate their manhood, join a warrior elite. So, you know, we've, we've got some troubled people in crisis who basically, for them, self-medication is Al-Qaeda's ideology. I was asked uh, uh, after uh, Nidal Hassan's attack at, at, uh, at, at Fort Hood, Texas, by Senator, and I was testifying before the Senate, Senator Lieberman, he said, Mr. Jenkins, he said, some people have described uh, Nidal Hassan as a terrorist, others have described him as a very troubled man, where do you come down on this? And I said, the two aren't mutually exclusive. Uh, terrorism is not an activity that attracts the well-adjusted. <laughs> you know, um, the, the, for some of them it is adventure, participation in an epic struggle, glory, as they say, solution to personal crises. In some cases they're just pulled along by pallets. Um, now, What's interesting, by the way, is, is uh, when, we, when, we, when we, we look at this, so much of this is, is one-off. We, we don't find a lot of interconnectivity between these, these cases. There's not like a continuing specific group. That's, we find a little bit of that in terms of Somali recruiting, mainly up in Minneapolis. Um, and here's where, by the way, it becomes really um, uh, granular. Uh, we can't talk about American Muslims. You have to look at individual communities, and not even individual ethnic communities. I mean, within any diaspora, you have to look at the, the Somali community in Minneapolis is very different from the Somali community in Lewistown, Maine, or the Somali community in San Diego, California. Those are three big colonies, and they're very, very different, and, and the Minneapolis one is a stressed one. It, 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 it is. Um, and it's provided a lot of people that have gone off to Al-Shabaab. Question comes up, does the internet facilitate recruitment? Or does it dilute commitment? Now, as I say, they've placed a lot of emphasis on, on recruiting via the internet. Um, certainly, the internet allows uh, a, a lot of people access to this ideology. Um, but that also means it allows individual as opposed to group activity. In other words, you can come on and you can interact with the internet and not have to be a part of, a, a, a part of any group. And there's bad news for us, and that makes them hard to detect, unless we're watching the internet, which we are. But it also means that they're not getting together, in some cases, to actually do things, which is good. 68% of the terrorist plots uncovered in the United States, carried out by a single individual. Um, now, they're, they're, it, it does also allow them the opportunity, as I mentioned, to boast, to threaten, to exhort, to vent. They can have all sorts of psychological satisfaction without any physical risk. Um, used to be that Al-Qaeda was very skeptical about this and was telling the brothers, push back from the monitor and actually go out and do something. But subsequently, they had to recognize this, that, that, that online jihadism is, is now part of it. Otherwise, they'd be turning off their vast online uh, uh, army. Um, so it, what turns out here is that the internet is, has created a virtual army. And that army has remained virtual. And, and that's the point. It really has not yet translated. Insofar as instructions on the internet, yes, you can find instructions for building bombs on the internet. I want to remind you that without an internet, uh, our terrorists in this country in the 1970s, mostly with liberal arts educations, were actually able to build bombs that went off. I mean, we were in the 1970s dealing with 50 to 60 terrorist bombings a year in this country. Um, we are not dealing with that level of, 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 of violence today. In fact, if I go back to this, uh, this jihadist thing, we've had 37 plots to carry out terrorist attacks in this country by jihadist groups. No continuing terrorist campaigns. 68% uh, of those involve a single individual. Most of them, 
were immature, amateurish plots, only 11 of them had what could be generously called uh, an operational plan. That is, a specific target identified, uh, weapons identified, or some effort to acquire weapons, and some sequence of steps. We start here, and we ultimately end up attacking there. That's to say, that's a generous uh, accord that 11 of them had that. Of those 11, seven or more FBI stings. Uh, without, without someone adding some order to this, they don't get very far on their own. Um, um, only three actually involved an intent to do something, an actual attempt. And that was uh, uh, Faisal Shahzad and his, and his uh, infernal device and his SUV at Times Square, which fortunately didn't work, and two gunmen, uh, Carlos Bledsoe, who killed an army recruiting officer in Little Rock, wounded another, and of course Major Hassan, who killed 13 of his fellow uh, soldiers. Um, what the stings demonstrate is that intentions were there when the means were at hand. So if somebody handed these people what they thought was a bomb and said, here's a switch, you're going to blow up 100 people, they, were, they pressed it. They were ready to go. Um, but that on their own, there, there really isn't a great deal of determination and there's very low competence. And how do we explain that? Part of the reason we explain it, this gets into the tricky area of, of are, are, are we effectively with, with good intelligence, and by the way, I think intelligence has been undervalued in terms of the effectiveness of the FBI, uh, the JTTFs, uh, local police departments, in, in their efforts have really been enormously effective in rolling up uh, just about all of these terrorist plots. And I suspect, and I have to underline here, suspect, that that may have created a deterrent effect so that any would-be jihadist warrior looking at that who is capable of calculating risk is going to say, this, this ain't a good idea. So who does that leave? That leaves the dimmer zealots <laughs> who are really determined but fortunately not very competent. And, and, and they're the ones that, that can be picked off. Now, I don't want to say that, that you know, we should dismiss that threat. Dummies can be dangerous. Again, our federal prisons are, are filled with guys who, you know, who killed people but didn't get high SAT scores. And, and so we, we, we still worry about it. Now, let me turn to, in, in, in a few minutes remaining here, uh, let me turn to a different aspect of, 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 of terrorism. And, and this is going to be a little bit more uh, controversial because it's really what I think is the broader dilemma, whether, whether we approach this uh, from, the, uh, from the perspective of intelligence analysis as, as I do, or from the perspective of, of law enforcement as many of you do, or perspective of military, or perspective of American citizens. Um, this, is, this is where we really have to ask ourselves some questions. Many, many years ago, uh, um, I wrote that owing to developments in technology and changes in the political environment, power, and here I mean power crudely defined, simply as the capacity to, to kill, to destroy, to disrupt, to create alarm, to oblige us to divert vast resources to security, that that power was coming into the hands of smaller and smaller groups whose grievances, real or imaginary, it wasn't always going to be possible to satisfy. And how we were going to deal with that development in a, in a democratic society and remain a democratic society was one of the major challenges that, that, that we, we faced at that time and continue to face. And so how, how have we done? Now, look, as I say, I, I won't make it into the ranks of civil libertarians. The reality is that all democracies faced with a terrorist threat have changed the rules. They've changed the rules to increase physical security. They've changed the rules to facilitate intelligence collection. They've changed the rules creating new criminal offenses relating to terrorism. They broaden police powers, 
In some cases, they've altered trial procedures, and yet they have remained democracies. They've done so. But here the landscape is changing, and so when I look at that historical experience, from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, I say, okay, but it's, it's different now. Terrorism has, first of all, demonstrably escalated from the mostly symbolic violence, little bombs going off in, 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 in front of buildings in the 1970s, to, to the determination of today's terrorists to kill as many people as possible. That is a fundamental change, the desire to rack up as high a body count as possible. You know, the worst terrorist incidents measured in fatalities in the 1970s were in the tens. In the 1980s, this ascended to the hundreds. In on 9-11, it ascended into the thousands, and had the buildings not been evacuated so rapidly, it would have ascended to the tens of thousands. That's, that's what we really were anticipating on the morning of 9-11. Of, of Even without employing weapons of, of mass destruction, the, the, the casualties from today's terrorist campaigns can approach that of small wars. But these wars are wars without any distinction between a front line and a home front, between a military target and a civilian bystander. That's a difference. Many expect that tomorrow's terrorists will be armed with nuclear or, more likely, biological weapons. Another change is that although some of the past terrorist campaigns did persist for decades, governments treated these, these challenges as extraordinary circumstances requiring measures that would be temporary. Temporary measures. Whereas today, the prevailing notion on both sides of this contest, on Al Qaeda's side, on, on our side, is that of unending warfare. Um, America's preference for short, finite wars has been replaced by the realization, now having fought two of the longest wars in American history, that this goes on. It doesn't end with the death of bin Laden. It doesn't end with withdrawal from Afghanistan. In some fashion, this goes on indefinitely. That's a fundamental change. And many would argue that these new circumstances therefore require a completely different response, that the old rules no longer apply, that that terrorism is no longer a law enforcement matter, but that it is truly a war, not just in rhetoric, but operationally. And that therefore, there can be no distinctions between the actions we take abroad and the actions we take at home. War requires a commander in chief, not civilian courts, in the case of a terrorist-created catastrophe, the Constitution no longer applies. Now, that is a, a view. I mean, we just went through Congress with the National Defense Authorization Act, arguments that individuals apprehended in this country, they use the word captured, military term, not, not arrested, a law enforcement term, should be, can be, held indefinitely without charge, without trial, in military custody. Now, that was amended at the last minute to say, this legislation will not alter existing law. The problem is, existing law on this matter is not settled. We have, some Supreme, we have one Supreme Court decision, we have one appeals court decision. It is not settled what the President's authority is in terms of detention of American citizens or legal permanent residents on, on American soil. This is, still, this is still a movement. But the argument in the Senate, by the way, was that why should we have different rules abroad for what we do in this country? Now, I would agree that there are different rules on a battlefield. I'm a former soldier. On a battlefield, you don't check passports. <coughs> you, you engage the enemy. And doesn't make any difference to me whether that enemy happens to have been a U.S. citizen or not. He's on the other side. That is a legitimate target. But that's an area, we're talking about a, a combat zone, where the law does not apply. And so one can say, look, 
where the law does not apply, then we will use whatever measures we have to in order to uh, achieve our goals. But the courts are working here. And they have done a terrific job in this country in, in dealing with this. And, and yet you had a majority of senators who were willing to, to toss that. That causes some, uh, some misgivings. They wanted to authorize indefinite detention, military custody for all terrorist suspects, whether apprehended abroad or in the United States, including U.S. citizens. Judicial oversight of electronic surveillance has been reduced. Um, now, some good news, the Constitution, there's been a lot of pushing and shoving, the Constitution has prevailed, there have been no mass roundups, habeas corpus has not been suspended, civilian courts are still in business, and regarding this recent law, the President of the United States promises that American citizens arrested here will not be indefinitely detained or held in military custody, but that's a signing statement that he makes. A future President might have a, have a different view. And so while I can say happily that civil liberties have not been savaged in this country, they haven't been. On the other hand, it's fair to ask, are we dancing on the edge of tyranny here? Are we, are we getting up into an area where, where, where it is becoming dangerous? Now, democracy itself does not preclude voluntary submission to despotism. That's just a reality. A frightened a bellicose Congress can legislate, legislate away liberties just as easily as tyrants can seize them. I don't, I don't see a military coup, I don't see seizure, that's not what's going to take place here, but what we, can, what we are seeing is that incremental changes, incremental changes, small compromises have a cumulative effect. They begin to change things fundamentally. These measures, you say, okay, but these are all temporary measures, but they're not temporary measures. I mean, physical security is like linoleum. You know, it's easy to lay down. You can never get the stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> Review is politically risky. Any politician stepping forward to say, you know, I think we ought to have a fundamental review of what we're doing here, that is a, just the, the that's, not something which is, which is, which is, which is very, very powerful uh, of healing. Um, we have created a large, powerful bureaucracy dedicated exclusively to security, which inevitably exerts a powerful influence on public policy. When we have that size of an entity in Washington, that's muscle, and that affects policy. Now, I agree that providing for the common defense is, is the primary reason for government. That's why we have government. But increasingly, this has come to mean in the minds of the American public the abolition of all risk. And that is an unrealistic goal that invites failure and thereby only perpetuates our anxiety. This is our problem too. It is also a fact that political pressure is more powerful in one direction than another. The political risks of being branded as soft exceed the perceived political benefits of protecting liberty. It's just not the same balance. And if this is to be the permanent situation, then we can't look forward to any post-war demobilization or dismantling. Temporary emergency powers will remain in effect indefinitely. That is, they cease to be temporary. And so we, we do have at least the skeletal superstructure of a security state, not a tyranny, but a security state, a, a nation obsessed with its own security in place even if not activated. And we are in this curious position where we tolerate, and, and we do, we go to airports, we do a lot of things. We, we tolerate a lot of little tyrannies little tiny tyrannies, in the name of security in order to avoid not just terrorist attack, but the greater oppression that is likely to follow if terrorists do succeed in carrying out another large-scale attack. But that statement itself is kind of, kind of scary because it doesn't mean that it is the terrorist foes or our own government 
or ourselves, our own reactions, that we fear the most. <coughs> now, my own view in the long run is that terrorists aren't going to bring down the republic. Only we can do that. And that our ultimate defense of terrorism in our democracy is not going to be how many concrete bollards or new surveillance laws that we put into place or any things of this sort. It is ultimately going to depend on our own courage, our own self-reliance, our own sense of community, our own willingness to accept risk and deal with it realistically. And the demand that we have created for 100% security in what is already a terribly polarized political system in this country is going to expose us to the dangers. It's not the terrorists. It's what we're going to do or not do in response to that threat. Thank you very much. Brian, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm going to ask the first question. And, and absent the, uh, the snake and the 50 caliber machine gun and, <laughs> and the, torn turt, the torn shirt, which um, things may not bother you much, but you know, we had the, Brian and I had the honor, if you will, last time we saw each other, we were actually in Ottawa in Parliament. And other countries uh, do pay attention to what we do. And we happen to be in the company of a couple of senators um, from the Canadian government. And we were talking about a lot of different things. And I want to ask you now, uh, given the things you talked about today, and all of the items that really focused on the human element of this issue, if you were talking to the President of the United States, or the Secretary of Homeland Security, and they asked you, what keeps you up at night? What should they be worried about right now as a number one issue? What would you say? You know, it, it, I'm going to give you what, what may sound to be a contrarian answer to that. And, and it's not going to be the list of threats, terrorist threats, or the list of vulnerabilities in our, our society. I mean, uh, I was once, once asked by a senator in the Senate hearing, he said, uh, Mr. Jenkins, could you identify the, you know, uh, the vulnerabilities that in our society that we should worry about the most? And I said, the vulnerabilities? And gee, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be up to volume five. I wouldn't be outside of the state of Delaware in this thing. I mean, this is, <laughs> vulnerabilities are infinite. Um, and, and it's not what terrorists can do. We, we, we basically know pretty much what they can do. And even when we go out to some of the, you know, the far-fetched, um, doomsday scenarios. Um, I, I don't tend to worry so much ab ab about those. There is, by the way, an insidious thing that happened in, an, in, in analysis on, on, uh, as a consequence of 9-11. 9-11 fundamentally altered our perceptions of plausibility. And so that a lot of threats that were dismissed as, as, as far-fetched would have been dismissed as far-fetched the day before 9-11, the day after became mm -hmm. operative presumptions. Mm -hmm. And that really is an incorrect way of, of doing it. But, but I'm, not, I'm not recognized in the field of, of, of prophecy. So, so, so let me not get into the area of what terrorists may or may not do tomorrow. Okay. I think we can handle that. I mean, I have, I have extraordinary faith in, 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 in the, the power and institutions of, of, of this country and, 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 the, and the power of our democracy. We've gone through far wars. We've gone through civil wars. We've gone through major world wars. We went through the Cold War when there were tens of thousands of nuclear weapons in the Soviet Union. They weren't pointed at Paraguay. They were pointed at us. <laughs> and, and we went through that. So scary times, we can, you know, we've faced worse and, and we will deal with this. So Al-Qaeda does not keep me up at night. What kinds of things do I worry about? I, I, I do worry, as I was talking at the end there, about the long-term corrosive effects on our society. I, I worry that there will be some uh, revelation of some egregious abuse that will result in a, a hasty and inappropriate dismantling of some of these things. You know, you, you that, that um, 
the news media is hyperactive and the public's very fickle and, and a lot of things that have been put into place that are working. Um, one thing goes wrong and people say, well, we'll get rid of all of that. And so that's a concern. I, I do worry broadly it's, uh, 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 about the, the partisanship in, in our current politics. I know politics is a rough and tumble business, and, and, I, and I've been around the block a few times on this, and, and, I, and I have no illusions on this. But I often fly back from Washington, D.C. to California here saying, you know, Bin Laden is enemy number two. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way they look at it in Washington. I mean, everything that goes wrong is an opportunity to take a shot at the other side. Mm -hmm. Guys across the aisle, guys across the street, guys across the river, guys across the hallway. <laughs> this is all enough. And, and I don't know that they can spell national interest anymore mm -hmm. there. And, and, and that is a concern I have mm -hmm. about our society. Okay. Final thing, if I were advising uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security, is this is going to go on for a long time. Right. And so whatever we do better be sustainable. Exactly. And I don't mean just sustainable in terms of budget, given fiscal realities, it has to be sustainable in terms of budget, but in terms of our political system, in terms of our economy, in terms of its effects. Mm -hmm. uh, back to the study creators working on right now. If we're going to impose a bunch of security measures, we've got to make sure that we don't shut down the economy and the democracy at, 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 at the same time. And so let's really think hard about every new measure before we ratchet it up. There's, a, there's an American tendency to um, to want to be seen to be doing something whenever something goes wrong. When sometimes the right course of action may be, yeah, wow, that was a close call. Yeah, we got to work hard. But this is precisely the right time to do exactly nothing. Right. Thank you. All right. Um, I'll repeat your question. Sure. Uh, uh, Brian. Uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more, especially having spent the last three years in Washington, D.C., especially sort of the attitude the country has now of sort of zero tolerance. And in fact, a failure of an attempted uh, attack is seen as a failure of the entire national homeland security enterprise. Yes. Uh, but my question to you is, so how do we change that? How do we, because as you mentioned, it is, it is very problematic in so many ways. That is a problem. I mean, how is it that Americans have come to have these <coughs> completely, fairly unrealistic expectations uh, about security? Pirate is a long-term trend, by the way, that precedes 9-11. And that is with, in a litigious society, we have worked hard to abolish risk and punish sources of risk systematically so that you know, you can't, you can't send a kid to school with a peanut butter sandwich anymore because somebody might have, you know, peanut allergies in, in, in the school and so on. I mean, we really, this is a national obsession uh, uh, with the, and, and actually things are getting better, this is, which is it's really extraordinary in a world. If you look at, I mean, I, I'd have, when he was still alive, I'd have these great arguments with my father, who was a veteran of World War II. He was in Patton's army, and he would say, Boy, we live in terrible times. All this terrorism and things going. On. I said, Dad, I mean, it, I mean, you lived in an era of World War One and World War Two. Sixty million people, soldiers and civilians, killed. The twenty cent twentieth century was the bloodiest century in history. You know, when it came to slaughter, civilized nations could do it on an industrial scale. Uh, now we're dealing with Al Qaeda's. That's easy. Um, and, and, and the fact is, the, 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 the number of casualties in wars worldwide is going steadily down. Uh, in the United States, in the early 90s, mid-90s, homicide rate in this country, about 25,000 a year. It's about 15,000, 16,000 a year now. It's equivalent of three 9-11s every year. Uh, things are better. And yet, the public perceptions are that we are in greater danger. And there, there is a disconnect there. Part of it, I think, was a mistake in communications and messaging by the political leadership. And I say this, I'm a ferocious nonpartisan, by the way, so. And it's that 
basically what we have told the public is, you stand aside, we're going to take care of this. Uh, when instead it should have been engaging the public. Now, I don't mean creating street corner posses to go look for terrorists, but I mean in engaging the public more, giving the public something to do. If people are worried about biological catastrophes, whether man-made or natural, then let's engage people in useful roles and train them for doing that. Whether we begin so in the grammar schools, the high schools, the Boy Scouts, the Red Cross, churches, whatever, you've got something to do. In Israel, by the way, they engage the, the citizens a lot, not because they necessarily think that the citizens are going to individually make this huge contribution to national security, although they do, but the fact that they are engaged and have a useful function is a very good antidote to needless fear. So let's get real about risk. Uh, let's have politicians with sufficient courage to say, look, you know, we're not going to, can't stop every doggone bombing in this country. And it used to be worse in the 70s, by the way. Let's get real about the numbers here. And let's engage the public and build on American traditions of courage and self-reliance. That's what we're supposed to be about. Instead of treating citizens as all potential victims. And, and, and I think that's the first step. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Brian. Um, in your view, does the fact that traditionally the Al-Qaeda, taking the, the focus of over, overseas, has been, that Al-Qaeda has predominantly been dominated by, by Sunni extremists, and the fact that Hezbollah is essentially an extension of the Shiite-based government of Iran, does this make an essential baseline disagreement and source of mistrust that would prevent the Al-Qaeda from essentially standing on the shoulders or, or uh, availing themselves of the infrastructure of the Hezbollah? Really good question. Um, and and here, here we have some fundamental difference. By the way, Al-Qaeda is Sunni. And it, and, it, and, it, and it is quite happy blowing up Shia. I have no, no problems about that. In, 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 in Al-Qaeda's world view, um, infidels, uh, Shias, apostates, all, all legitimate appropriate targets. Um, some differences of opinion within Al-Qaeda about that when, when uh, uh, Zarqawi in Iraq was, was busy slaughtering fellow Muslims, um, Zawahri, number two in Al-Qaeda, said, you know, not sure all Muslims are going to readily understand this. <laughs> my, 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 you're, you're doing our constituency some damage there. Uh, and that, by the way, is one of the major strategic mistakes. I mean, Al-Qaeda, I think, made three, three major uh, strategic failures of Al-Qaeda. One was 9-11 itself, believing that, that that blow was going to drive America out of the Middle East. Didn't work or that it would provoke America into the Middle East and Al-Qaeda would be the beneficiary. That didn't work either. Second one was the slaughter of Muslims in the terrorist campaigns that followed, which if, if there was very little chance of a Muslim uprising on behalf of Al-Qaeda uh, coming out of the chutes, after that they had destroyed whatever, uh, whatever sympathies they had. And the third was, which I mentioned, the failure of their ability to arouse a serious, uh, 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 large-scale, homegrown, uh, homegrown threat. Uh, here, that, that's a battle that America won. America's power of assimilation of communities and tolerance defeated Al Qaeda's ability to try to to try to break that. Um, now back to back to the Sunni thing. Hezbollah uh, does have a worldwide network. Shiite-based, largely Lebanese-based, 
uh, among uh, among uh, Lebanese uh, diaspora in in um, in uh, South America, um, in parts of the United States, parts of Africa, parts of Europe. Um, the ones that get involved in these various activities are often involved in criminal pro enterprises anyway, smuggling, all sorts of trafficking and so on, and they kick in some money to his, his law for this. And that network has been used primarily for fundraising for his law, uh, on occasion for terrorist activity, and certainly it is a network that Iran could activate, and that would be a, a, a new threat. But it's not one which Al-Qaeda can easily fasten itself. That does not mean, however, that Iran can't at the same time, where a number of Al-Qaeda leaders do resign, that Iran cannot use Al-Qaeda to provoke mischief elsewhere. So in a confrontation with Iran, we can get it from both Iranian-backed Al-Qaeda and Iranian-backed Hezbollah, but they're not like, they're likely to be different networks. Thank you. Okay. Isaac? Sure. Uh, addressing your uh, idea of the never-ending war and the realization of the, the unrecognized cost of security, Mike and I were just immersed at Ohio State University, and we witnessed the number of Viper teams, explosion detections, the perimeter that are established, restricted airspace, all those are huge costs that are borne at almost every major stadium. Mm -hmm. And these are costs that are not visible to the public. How can we address that in some way? A great, great question. By the way, it's interesting. I'm, I, I serve as a member of, of an advisory group to uh, uh, Secretary Napolitano. It's interesting when we have the meetings, we have uh, two meetings a year, and we spend about three, four hours uh, with her going over the going over these things. Her single worry when she asks questions of the group is what should I be worried about? What what new threat is out there that I, you know, that I've got to have I've got to have something in the field, something deployed to block it. Because her her perspective, the department's perspective is that I they have to block every conceivable possible threat. And so, gee, you know, I mean, this year it's cyber. Mm -hmm. So, uh, got to block that. And biological, oh, got to have that. And, and that is the, that's what happens when you create, which I was uh, in favor of doing really, but that's what happens when you create a Department of Homeland Security. It views the world exclusively through a security lens, and it will populate uh, every possible threat with a, a, a countermeasure. Um, now, um, how, how do we get past that? First of all, it would be nice to have, you said it, it, nobody counts the cost of these things. I would love to see government produced, Department of Homeland Security produce or OMB produce, the counterterrorism budget. What is this nation spending in all of its departments, DOD, DHS, HHS, what is it spending at the federal level? And how is that allocated? Because we talk about strategies. Strategy is an allocation of, of resources. Does the allocation of resources match up with any notions of strategy and threat? Or is it being driven by something else? We know that there are a lot of other drivers in it. Um, so can we come up with the counterterrorism, putative counterterrorism budget. Can we add to that the budget that the state and local governments are paying and the private sector? And come up with, what is this? Is, this, is it a trillion? Is it a billion? Is, what is it in, in, in terms of numbers? Difficult to do, but it would be very, very useful. I think, just as kind of a cautionary note on new security measures, is I would, uh, I know it's a pain in the neck for, for developers to, ha to have to write environmental impact reports. <laughs> but I would say before we do something like deploy a thousand body scanners, that we want to have not only an, est an estimate of the additional capital investment, 
but the operating and maintenance costs over 10 years, the effects on the economy, the cascading effects of any measure. And so I'd like to see it, it, that imposed, that before we add one more thing, we have a good discussion of what does this really, what's this really going to run us in direct costs and indirect effects over this long run. We don't do that now. Mm -hmm. We just don't do it. If, if we conveyed that if we're investing in homeland security, we are not investing in curing cancer or feeding the homeless, as soon as we start making those trade-offs, we start thinking about those things that you're just pointing out. Right. No, I, I agree. You can't make, by the way, you, I, I, it's really hard to, to do strict cost-benefit analysis, and, 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 and we know that. Um, but certainly we can get better at, and I don't mean just dollar figures, I mean in the, in the broadest sense, impact on economy, impact on society, and so on. I mean, if we, if we, proliferate, our, if we proliferate inner perimeters in our society, I mean, create kind of a neo-medieval society where you, you move from one perimeter to another, what does that really mean in terms of society itself, economy, all transactions, human intercourse, all of that? Um, we, we just don't think in that direction. The analysis has not taken us in that direction. Gonna. Professor Krieger. Um, your remarks about Homeland Security remind me of what the Defense Department does in the following, now does. You have the Court General Defense Review, which is, you know, partially um, ritualistic, but they have to think about it. And there's, you know, there's probably a presidential directive about what the national um, grand strategy is. Mm -hmm or at least, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, Charlie Wolf wrote an article 40 years ago, 30 years ago, called The Costs of, of the Soviet Empire. One guy. So it strikes me two things. What you should tell Napolitano to start doing is, one, we want strategy explicit. You know, like, you know, a grand strategy, which includes all of your various things. I suspect we spend too much time worrying about Muslims and not enough about something else. That's just my intuition. Um, if they were Christians, maybe they would get less attention. Um, but the second thing is someone, and it doesn't have to be a committee, maybe you, sits down and knows these things and makes a rough estimate. You don't need a large committee to do this. You need someone who looks at the budget, an economist maybe, sure it's hard to get multipliers and so forth, so maybe you'll only be able to talk about expenditures. All right? And maybe some opportunity costs. I don't believe, by the way, that you're going to trade off money spent for defense or homeland security for something else. That's not how the budget works. Mm -hmm. You may think it works. You'd like it to that work. No, no, it doesn't work that way. It's, it, you know, it, as far as I can see. Uh, so I think it is totally possible to get what you want. But the thing we don't have is that kind of strategic overview of homeland security that, for example, is standard production for DOD. I, I, I couldn't agree more. DOD is more sophisticated. I mean, no, been at this longer. Years to get to that I know. I'm, I, yeah, but I mean, they got there because they've been doing it for a, for a much longer time. And also, gold, war, and nickels, and a whole bunch of things came along. You, you get at this one of two ways. You say, look, how much are we spending and how are we spending it? And that is our strategy. Or you say, this is our strategy. How much are we spending and how are we spending it? Does it match? No, they won't match ever because of politics. And yeah. Don't try for rationality. Just <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's crazy. Uh, you know, that's the sure way to be unhappy. No. Because, you know, if, if there were ever Dirksen around, how much more Illinois would get than other places? Yeah. That's not the point. The point is to have some statement and some idea what the numbers yeah. are. They'll never agree because there's much federal budget budgets are always about other things right mm -hmm. but both of them would be useful to have mm -hmm. right now we have lots of agencies with lots of missions but as far as I know there's no grand strategy the you know the grand strategy we do have is more it's 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 when you look at what we call our our, our counterterrorism strategy it's really desiderata I mean it's 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 yes we want to you know prevent disrupt. It's, it's a list of things we'd like to do. It doesn't really take us to the next step as well. How are you going to really, how are you, you going to really do that? And what does that really mean? <coughs> Let me give you two examples and then I'll shut up. One, after the World War II, 
we followed George Kennan and had containment as a, as a defense policy. And eventually, more recently, we have selective engagement. We, for a while, we had, let's find everything, you know, Dick Cheney's 1% idea. But that's just too expensive and crazy. But the point is, there are ideas floating around whether it be containment or selective engagement, but there are really good ideas, but they, I don't hear them. But do you hear them? You know, there, there, are, there are islands of, 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 of thought within this sort of sea of, of, of bureaucracy that, <laughs> that exists. Um, so, you know, can you say, yes, have you seen a, a smart thing here and a smart thing there? And the answer is yes. Overall, no, it, 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 it isn't. The process is, is very much uh, reactive to the latest event, reactive to the latest threat. Uh, and I don't disagree that political pressures um, are, are ultimately in Washington guide everything, influence everything. But, you know, in, in at least, at least in the DOD, to use your example, when the Secretary of Defense and the, 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 um, the chiefs of staff decide, look, these are the weapon systems that we want, these are the ones that we care less about, and they, and they fight that out. At least there is a counter to the political drives on, on, on the Hill. Absent having that, then the political drives and yesterday's events and tomorrow's nightmare can operate, in a sense, with a clear running field because there's nothing to stand up in the way to say, no, we, we really don't want to do that, or this makes greater sense than that. If you don't have that to begin with, then you are just tossed about the waves of events. And, and in fact, now, we've done, despite the, 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 you know, those shortcomings, in the 10 years since 9-11, we've, we've done pretty well. As I say, we have pounded the hell out of Al-Qaeda's operational capabilities. That's good. Um, it has been at enormous cost. Um, and given the cost, I, I, I would assert we can't keep, the, we can't, we can't go into the next 10 years spending and doing what we did in the previous 10. We will, Al-Qaeda will take us down if we do that. So Brian, I'm going to ask you just for uh, closing comments. Anything? No, I mean, what you, what you know, interesting enough, I've been at this for a lot of years. And, and what's fascinating about the topic of terrorism and, and, and most challenging is you, you, you start out dealing with what you think are the, the basic tactical kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, gee, or, or small issue. How do terrorists make bombs? How do we stop the bombing? You know, terrorists take hostages. How do we bargain for human life? Mm -hmm. Things like that. And over a period of time, you really begin to realize that, that you're dealing with much broader, fundamental, philosophical issues. What are, what are the basic values that we are trying to protect? What values govern our measures in protecting us? What is the right thing to do in every sense of that word? Mm -hmm. and, and that really gets tough. Having said that, let me just go back to where I was before. I have, um, I just have extraordinary confidence in, the, in this nation. Mm -hmm. And yes, I do have worries about all these things that I mentioned, I, I do it. I, I think we, we will come through this. I don't think we have been well served by our political leadership. I don't think we have been well served by our, our, our media in all cases. I don't think that we have been, uh, I don't think we have been well served by, quite frankly, the, the civil liberties community, I think, in, in, in many cases. Um, they're, they're, they have squandered their credibility and resources on 
on, on taking on everything, talk about absence of strategy, that is often more dictated by recruiting drives and fundraising than, than really addressing some fundamental things. So yeah, I don't, I don't think we've been well served, but, but at the end of the day, I mean, we get what we vote for, we get what we pay for, we get what we're willing to put up, and this comes down to us as, as citizens. And, and uh, so we, we will do this. It will be bumpy and messy, and we'll make mistakes and we'll screw it up, but in the, in the long run, 10 years from now, when I come back to give the next lecture, <laughs> thank you. we'll be here. Thank you. I want to thank you for being so patient. Um, we have a tradition here. And so, uh, Brian, on behalf of University of Southern California, on behalf of CREATE, we'd like to thank you for a wonderful talk today and, and give you a token of our appreciation as another distinguished speaker. Thank you.